Amen. So we're going to, I'm going to be starting here a series that will be continuing over time, however uh, long that ends up being, or over what time frame, called I Am What God Says I Am. I Am What God Says I Am. And today we want to talk about the righteousness of God, that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. This is a, a very basic foundation for being an ark builder. This is a very basic foundation for having a victorious Christian life. But before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit about believing what it is that God says about us and how important that is. We tend to live our life believing what we think is right, what we think is good, what we have learned here and there. But what we really need to do is to learn to live our life by what God says about us. We need to develop our self-image about ourselves from what God has said about us. We know from Hebrews 6.18... That God says that he cannot lie. Let me read that to you. By these two immutable things, and he's talking there about his promise and his oath, in which it was impossible for God to lie, that we may have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. It is impossible for God to lie. So when he says something in his word, then we have to take it as truth. When he says something about us, about who we are, we need to take him at his word because he cannot lie. It's better to believe what God says, even though we may not understand it. It's better to believe what God says than it is to try to understand it and wait until we understand it, until we believe it and start acting on it. His thoughts are above our thoughts. Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9. I'm going to start in verse 7 actually. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon for my thoughts says the Lord are not your thoughts neither are my ways your ways says the Lord for as the heavens are higher than the earth so my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts so he his thoughts the way he thinks about things the way he sees the world the way he sees our lives are higher than what we think. So we need to find out what his thoughts are. And Jeremiah 29.11 gives us some understanding of his thoughts. For, uh, he's, for God says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace, of welfare, of well-being. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you an expected end. To give you a hopeful outcome. To give you what you are believing for. So, his thoughts towards us are thoughts of our peace, of our welfare. That word there, of course, is shalom. Thoughts of our, our, our well-being, of our peace, of our wholeness. And so, when we see what it is that God says about us, Know that it's for our welfare. Know that it's for our peace. Know that it's for good for us. And so we need to grab hold of those things and, and move with it. Another important concept here is to realize that a man, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. It says that in Proverbs 23.7. I'm going to read that whole passage to you because many times we just throw that out. But I want you to see the context of what it's talking about here. I'm going to start in verse 6. Eat thou not the bread of him who has an evil eye, neither desire his dainty meats. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. 
Eat and drink, he says. But his heart is not with you. So even though his words are saying one thing, it's what he believes in his heart. And he has evil thoughts. Thoughts that are bad. Thoughts that are negative towards you. But he's saying, eat and drink. And enjoy yourself. But in his heart, he doesn't want that. He doesn't believe that. So as a man thinks in his heart, that's the way he really is. Now this is a very important concept for us to understand. Because it's from the heart, from our core value, that gives us the faith and the power to believe God and to see his word work in our life. I like to put it like this. You are the you you think you are. You are the you you think you are. You change the you that you are by changing the you that you think you are. That is very important. We need, in order for us to change our self-image, we have to think differently about ourselves. And my contention is, and what I'm trying to get across here, is that we need to think about ourselves the way that God thinks about us. It doesn't matter what life has thrown us. It doesn't matter what people have said about us. It doesn't matter what side of the track you grew up on. It doesn't matter whether you're 89 or 9. It doesn't matter whatso whatsoever. If we believe what God has said about us, and that becomes part of our core value, that we sincerely, really believe it to the point where we put the full weight of our being on what God has said about us, no matter what the circumstances around us look like, then that is one thing, that is something that is very important that will help us to be overcomers. So part of this series is to look at some of those things that God says about us and how to get them into our hearts. We need to understand these things, to meditate on them, to understand them, to know them. And that's the, the, the next point is that the transformation of our lives begins when our mind is renewed. What is it that God says about us? And as we begin to hear what his word has to say, and we meditate on it, and the word of God begins to take life in us, begin to, to give us life, then it transforms our life. It starts in our mind and understanding, but then it gets into our hearts as we then act upon it and do it. Concept we've heard around here a lot. The transformation starts with our mind. Ephesians chapter 1, um, verses 17 through 20, says this, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, this is Paul's prayer, he's praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. In that intimate knowledge of understanding who he is and how he works in our lives. Understanding what his word has to say. Understanding in this context what it is that he says about us. That he's praying here the Lord would give us a spirit of wisdom and understanding. A spirit of wisdom and revelation in him through the knowledge. Verse 18. The eyes of our understanding, and in the Greek that's cardia, the eyes of our heart being enlightened. In other words, that the word of God, the wisdom and revelation that we receive from the knowledge of God begins to become implanted into our hearts. Implanted into our hearts. So that you may know, going on to um, verse 19, or in verse 18, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, which is to be sons of God, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? Everything that he has done for us to allow us to become those uh, sons of God. And, verse 19, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe? According to the working of, the, of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. 
the eyes of our heart being enlightened, that we would know who we are in Christ, what he has done for us, and the power that is then behind it. Because when we understand what God has said about us, who we are in Christ, it gives such power to our lives and such stability. And so what we want to talk about today specifically is that we are the righteousness of God. That is our standing before God. That we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Because of what Jesus has done for us, we are the righteousness of God. See, our righteousness does not come from our works. That was the argument that Paul, in a couple of different places, in Romans, and then we see it again with Hebrews and the writer of Hebrews, trying to make that distinction, that it is not the righteousness that is derived by the law, because people kept trying to do their own righteousness. They did not understand what God was saying in the Old Testament about righteousness. See, Abraham says that he believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. But somehow they miss that. And what they began to equate righteousness with, it, with was doing the works of the law. As you accomplished all the jots and tittles and every little speck of the law, then you were righteous. But God says, no, that's not, what, that's not the way I set it up. You believe God, believe him, Put your trust in him, and that is accounted to us for righteousness. In Romans uh, 10, verses 3 and 4, it says, But they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, that um, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. See, it's our believing it's not our doing that makes us righteous. When we believed what God said about Jesus Christ, that he came and gave himself for us, Who, whosoever believes in their heart that God uh, raised him from the dead and confesses with their mouth, or I'm sorry, believes in their heart and confesses with their mouth, then they shall be saved. They shall be redeemed. And that is what brings us our righteousness, our righteousness in Christ. Titus 3 puts it this way, For we ourselves were something foolish, disobedient, deceived, uh, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, towards man appeared, not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. So our righteousness is not derived by the things that we do. It's derived because what Jesus has done for us. And this is an important concept for us to understand. Jesus' shed blood washed away all of our sins. Washed away all of our sins, past, present, and future. His shed blood washed them all away. I'm going to read to you from Hebrews 9, starting in verse 11. But Christ, being come as a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of the calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of heifers, sprinkling the unclean sacrifice to, uh, to the purifying of the faith, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purged our conscience from dead's works to serve the living God. 
And then from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 and 12, And every priest stands by daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. All of our sins have been forgiven. And because of that, we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Which we see, of course, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. This is the most explicit statement here. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It is him, him taking all of our sin upon himself that made us the righteousness of God. Thank you, Jesus. In Romans chapter 5, verses 17 through 19, it says, For if by one man's offense death reign by one, much more, they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. Righteousness is a gift that we have been given. Shall, the one who receives the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by the one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon, by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Verse 19, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the disobedience of one shall many be made righteous. So by Jesus' obedience, by him giving himself uh, and, and his blood being shed, all of our sins were remitted, washed away, past, present, and future. And it left us in a great state. And that is in the state of righteousness. Righteousness being the ability to stand in the presence of God without a sense of guilt, condemnation, or inferiority. Because all of our sins have been washed away. That is our righteousness. To be able to stand before him in confidence. Because God sees us through the blood of Jesus. He doesn't see the sin that we keep committing over and over again. He sees us through the blood of Jesus. Where all of our sins have been washed away. All of our sins have been washed away. You need to get that. All of our sins have been washed away. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We need to develop what's been called a righteousness consciousness. So that when we see ourselves, when we think about ourselves, we are thinking of ourselves with a righteousness consciousness, not a sin consciousness. The blood of Jesus has washed away our sins. They are gone, past, present, and future. I really want to hammer this home because it is important for us to believe that. We don't walk around with a sin consciousness. We'll talk about the results of that in a few minutes. We need to walk with a righteousness consciousness. Because that is what will help us in these last days to overcome. This is the basis. See, when we believe, and we must believe this, when we believe this, it puts us in a place of understanding that all that God has done for us through Jesus Christ is ours. There is no reason, there is nothing that is blocking God's 
power towards us. There is nothing blocking God's promises towards us. There is nothing that's blocking God's blessing towards us. We, all of the work that Jesus has done for us, we have full access to the ministry of Jesus. We have full access to everything that the Holy Spirit has done for us. We have full access to the love of God because of what Jesus has done for us. There is nothing that is keeping those things from us. Now, we may think there are, because we can say, well, what a sec. What about last week when I really messed up? How can God still use me when I do stuff like that? I mean, we can go through those thoughts all day long. But see, that is a sin consciousness. We need to have a righteousness consciousness. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Didn't we just read that? Didn't we just read that? That Jesus took our sin upon himself so that we could be made the righteousness of God? Not what it said? That is how God sees us. Through the blood of Jesus as righteous. Now, that doesn't mean that the sins that we continue to commit, that doesn't mean that they just automatically go away. This isn't a license to do things that are against God's word. We know, though, that what Jesus has done for us, what God has provided for us, is forgiveness of those sins every single day, every single time we commit them. So we don't approach it as boy, I'm such a sinner, I need to keep going to God to receive uh, right, uh, forgiveness for these sins. No, we think of it as, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And yeah, I did this thing wrong, but you know what? God has already provided a relief from that, has already provided my forgiveness for that. So then we go to him and we ask forgiveness. We receive our forgiveness. Let me put it that way. We receive the forgiveness because it has already been done for us. And the, the formula is very easy. It's very clear. If we, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, confess means to say with or to agree. If we confess our sins, we agree with God that this that we did, that this that we said, that this that we thought, that this sin is a sin that promises that God is faithful and he will forgive us of that sin and then to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, all those sins that we don't know about at this point. That is the promise. So we approach God not on the basis of I'm such a sinner and God help me here, but we approach him on I am the righteousness of God. And Yes, I have done some things wrong, but God has forgiven me. I go to him for that forgiveness that he has already provided. Now let's look at it at a little bit different way as we go into the next section there on living in righteousness. Now, I could, I, I really struggled with this, with this lesson, or with this message today because I kept wanting to go into things, well, how do we overcome the sin? How do we do this? And how do we get set free? And all these kind of things. But the Lord just kind of really said, that's, that is not the purpose of this uh, sermon today. This purpose, the purpose of this sermon is to understand the righteousness of God and that we are the righteousness of God. So when I talk about living in righteousness, I'm not talking about how to overcome sin. I'm talking about what the results of righteousness bring into our lives. And the results of the fact that we are righteous before him. However, this first part will kind of reflect on both, on both sides of it. So let's look. I want you to turn in your Bible uh, for these next two passages. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18. I actually want to start in verse 15. For even unto this day, when Moses is read, 
the veil is upon their heart. And this is talking about the, Paul is talking here about the difference between the administration of the law and the administration of grace. And he's talking about how Moses, when he was up on the mountain and received the Ten Commandments, it said that when he came back down, his face uh, shone so bright that the people said, you need to cover yourself. So he wore a veil. And he is saying that spiritually what has happened is that because of the law, that a, when the law is read, there is a veil that covers people's lives from understanding the righteousness of God. And so that's why he's saying there, but even until this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, in other words, no veil, right? We all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. When he's talking here about beholding is in a glass, that's talking about the mirror. And we know from another passage, which we'll look at in a few minutes in James, that is talking about the mirror of the Word of God. So as we, with an open face, without anything hidden, without any, with an open heart, uh, in humility, with an open face, beholding as in a glass, beholding at the glory of the Lord like in a mirror. And what do we see when we look into this mirror of God's Word? We see the glory of God. We see what He has done for us, what He has promised for us. He, we also see what he, how He thinks about us. So when we look into in the glass, in the mirror of God's word, what we should be seeing reflecting back towards us is the righteousness of God. We should be seeing that we are the righteousness of God because that's what God's word tells us. And we see that glory of the Lord in our righteousness. Then it says that those who do that are changed from glory to glory. So as we focus on the fact that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, what will begin to come out, what will begin to come into our lives, is the more and more of the ability to then walk in a practical day-by-day -day basis in that righteousness. In other words, we'll begin to sin less and less. Because now, instead of having a, a sin consciousness, which keeps us thinking, I'm a sinner, and I, I keep doing these things. When we have a righteousness consciousness, we understand that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Then we begin to have a flow out of our life towards righteousness, towards doing things that are right. So this is an important thing for us to, to look at. Look at what it says then in James. In James chapter 1, Starting in verse 21, wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. In other words, stop sinning. And receive with meekness the engrafted word. That's that word that gets into our heart. Receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But be, verse 22, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if we are hearer, are a hearer of the word and not a doer, we are like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass or in a mirror. But when he looks in, I'm sorry, verse 24, but he beholdeth himself and goes away and straightway forgets what manner of man is. He was. So this was talking about someone that goes, he looks at himself, and he sees something. Now, we can look at it from two different ways. He either sees the mess that he is, 
or he sees how good he looks. And so we can say, well, we go to the Word of God and we can see how we don't match up to it. Or we can go to the Word of God and we say, wow, that's the way God sees me. Wow, that's the way that I want to live. Wow, that's what I want to be like that in the Word. So we can look at it like that. Verse 25, but he that looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues. In other words, you're now looking at, now you're looking at the good things of what God says about you. You're looking at the good things of his word, of the promises, of the blessings that we have. And those things are being reflected back to us. And we desire then to live up to those things. And it says, if we continue in them, not being a forgetful hearer, but continuing in them, then it says we are blessed in our deeds. In our, other words, our doing. Because the object of the word of God is to look at it, to see it, and then to begin to do it. Not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word. Then we are blessed. We receive what the word of God promises us. So as we look into the word of God, and we see that we are to be the righteousness of God, it should draw out of us the desire to be more righteous on a daily basis. In other words, to live out what the righteousness that we know we are on the inside. Now, one of the reasons why the righteousness of understanding who we are in Christ and, the, and that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. One of the reasons why that's so important is because that gives us confidence before God. If we go to God to pray for something, to intercede on behalf of somebody else, to pray for some issue that's going on in our own life, and we have this thing of, man, I've just really blown it, and I know I'm not where I need to be, and you know, I didn't do all my affirmations today and, and all these things. And how can God hear me and answer me if I'm just, you know, this lowly little sinner? But see, if we have a righteousness consciousness, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and he is not withholding anything from me, then there's no reason for our heart to condemn us. There's no reason for us to walk in condemnation. Because when we stand in the presence of God, like I read earlier, that righteousness is the ability to stand in the presence of God without the sense of guilt or condemnation or inferiority. In other words, there is no reason why God should withhold from me what I'm requesting. Now in 1 John chapter 3, we see that same uh, thing lived out here. Verse 19, and hereby we know that we are of the truth and that we assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence towards God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. See, as we are focusing on the fact that we are the righteousness of God, we know who we are in Christ, it gives us confidence to come before him. And in that confidence of coming before him, you know what? We're going to start letting those sin issues in our life fall to the wayside. Thank you, Jesus. It gives us confidence in God that our prayers will be answered. Another aspect of living in the righteousness is that we are to live as instruments of righteousness. I want us to turn in our Bibles also now to Romans chapter 6. We have mentioned this before. Uh, Pastor has, and I'm going to mention it again. You really need to get to know Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8. The truths that are contained in these verses, in these chapters, are really foundational for us in these end days. We've got to know who we are in Christ, what Jesus has done for us, uh, overcoming sin, understanding the power of God uh, that has been directed towards us. So let's, uh, let's look now at uh, chapter 6. I'm going to start in verse 11. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead to sin, 
indeed unto, or be dead unto sin, but alive unto God through Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us therefore reign, or I'm sorry, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies, that you should obey it in its lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God, that those as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. See, as we reckon ourselves dead to sin, as we are living in the righteousness that God has already provided for us, then that begins to show itself in the way that we act, in the way that we do things in our life, that we are revealing the righteousness of God in us. We don't let sin reign in our mortal bodies. We yield ourselves as instruments now of righteousness. What that means is, what that is talking about here, is the righteousness that is within us, because we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, begins to show itself, and we become instruments of righteousness. We know how to, to do that, how to be instruments of righteousness, because we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And sin shall, have, shall not have dominion over us. What then? Shall we continue in sin? I'm in verse 15. Because we are not under the law, but under grace, God forbid, know ye not that, though, that to whom you yield yourselves as servants to obey, his servants you are whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that we were all servants of sin, but you have obeyed him from the heart, that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, you became servants of of righteousness. Servants of righteousness. The, uh, the next thing I want to talk about here is that we reign in life because of righteousness. We read this scripture already, but I, wanted to, I want to read it again. Verse 17 of Romans 5. For if by one's man offense, one man's offense, sin reign by one, much more, they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Shall reign in life by one. Because we are the righteousness of, of God in Christ Jesus, it gives us the ability then to overcome. To know that everything that comes against us, that the power of God is right there in our lives, in our mouth, ready to go after that. I remember one incident in my life where I saw this, this happen. Um, it was, I believe, the very first time that uh, pastor and pastor were not here on a Friday night, and I was in charge uh, for that night. And I can't remember if guest speaker was coming or not, but I was the one who was supposed to kind of coordinate things and stuff. And uh, so anyway... This one uh, person walks in the door, and I could tell as soon as he walked in the door, I thought something is wrong here. And, and so he comes in, and then I thought, I need to go talk to this guy, because I, I saw him from over, from over there come in the front door. So I walked around this way, and I, I met him in the kitchen. And I looked at him, and this guy was in full manifestation. I mean, I looked right in his eyes, and I saw... I saw looking back at me, I didn't see this man, I saw a demon looking back at me. I mean, he was in, he was in full manifestation. And, uh, and I, I thought, oh Lord, what am I going to do? <laughs> and then I thought, wait a second. I know who I am in Christ. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I have power and authority. I just looked that guy right straight in the eye. I looked that demon right in the eye. And I said, in the name of Jesus, go down now in Jesus' name. And I began to speak peace over that man and peace over that situation. And it wasn't within two or three minutes that you could see the demon began to go down. His eyes cleared up and, and you could tell. And I thought, well, praise the Lord. <laughs> so... 
Amen. And then he was, he was good through the rest of the service. Heard a few growls every once in a while, but, but basically. <laughs> so that was, uh, that, was, that was a long time ago. I, we've come a long way since then <laughs> in terms of dealing with uh, demons and stuff. But, uh, but, but see, when you have confidence in God, when you know who you are in Christ, then you can reign in life and over everything that the evil one throws at you, whether it be something in your body, something in your pocketbook. You know, the other day I was um, going through my finances, and I was looking at some things, and, and I was thinking, Lord, I said, I need some, we need some help here. I said, you know, we've been standing in faith. We've been believing. Uh, we've got some bills here that need to be paid, and Lord, we just really need your help here. And I was just crying out to the Lord. You know, been, we've been doing affirmations and we've been believing God. We've been declaring, you know, money cometh and all these things. But it just didn't seem like things were happening. And I remember that morning I was crying out to the Lord uh, about that. And, I, and one of the things that I was, was relying on was the fact that, Father, you are my God. I am your child. I am in the righteousness of God. And Lord, you've promised these things. And wouldn't you know it? Just a few hours later, somebody handed me a check. And I thought, wow, Lord. And it was exactly what we needed. Took care of, of all these bills that needed to get paid. And so thank you, Jesus. I was trying to figure out how we're going to do this. You know, do I take, you know, borrow money from here or take money out of this thing? And I said, nope, God provides our needs. See, when we know who we are in Christ and what he has done for us, then it helps us to overcome. When a challenge comes to our body, you know, when deep in our hearts we know, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, when we know that Jesus has paid the price for, my, for our uh, healing, that when the challenge comes, we can put our foot down and say no to the devil and mean it and know that healing is going to come because we know our God. Because it is deep down in our heart that we know who we are in Christ and what he has done for us. We reign in life through the righteousness. The fact that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 6 verse 7, it says, Paul is talking here about him overcoming, and he's saying, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. So whatever the challenges that we are going through, righteousness becomes an armor for us. It protects us. When the evil one tries to come and say to us, you're going to fail. This isn't going to work. Remember that sin you did last week? Remember that sin you did yesterday? Remember that sin you did five minutes ago? It's not going to work. And you say, no. The righteousness of God is my armor. Matter of fact, in Ephesians 6.14, it says that we are to put on the breastplate of righteousness. And that breastplate covers, of course, this part of our body. It covers our heart. Because when we believe in our heart who we are in Christ, when we believe in our heart that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, those arrows of condemnation, those arrows of guilt that the evil one tries to send against us, they just bounce off that armor of righteousness, that breastplate of righteousness. Because we know who we are in Christ and what he has done for us. We say, no, devil, you just get out of here. I know who I am. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You have no right to bring this sickness, this uh, disability or whatever, this infirmity to my life. We have the armor of righteousness. And it tells us in several places that we are to put on the new man created in righteousness. That is that new man of our righteousness. And we put that on, that, that cloak. In, in um, Romans chapter 13, verse 14, it says that we are to put on Christ. 
and make no provision for the flesh. Put on that new man created in righteousness. Now this section here, this benefits of righteousness is one of my favorites. Because, you know, we don't normally think about it in this way. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And because we have a righteousness consciousness, we need to realize the wonderful benefits that the righteousness gives to us. In Psalm 11, verse 7, It says, for the righteousness, or for the right, for the righteous Lord loves righteousness, and his countenance does behold the upright. God loves us. He loves the righteous. He loves the upright. You can, you can claim that. Lord, I thank you that you love me. You love the righteous. Matter of fact, in John 17, 23, Jesus says it this way, I in them and thou in me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know, now this is Jesus talking, that thou, talking about his disciples, that, that I'm talking about God, that thou has loved me and has loved them as thou has loved me. God loves you as much as he loved Jesus. God loves you as much as he loved Jesus. And we know that it says right there that God beholds the upright and he loves righteousness. So he loves us. If he loves righteousness, he loves us because we are the righteous. In Psalm 34, verse 19, on your outline, that should be 19, not 9. Psalm 34, 19 says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Amen. So you are the righteous. He will deliver you. Because we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. In Psalm 92 verse 12. The righteous flourish like the palm tree. There is increase. There is flourishing in our lives. Ver, uh, the scripture says. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. So there is a, a freshness, a, 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 a flourishing in our lives because we are the righteous. Here's a couple of them that you'll like. The Lord hears the prayer of the righteous. In Proverbs 15:29, it says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. And we are righteous before him. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He hears our prayer. And in James chapter 5, actually starting in verse 16, he says, Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And it's talking here about Eli Elijah. Eli Elijah was a man subject to like passions that we are. He prayed earnestly that it may not rain, and it rained not on the earth for the space of three years, and six months, and he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. So just as Elijah, as a man who believed God, which was accounted unto him as righteous, in the same way, we are righteous, and because we are righteous, God hears our prayer, and he will answer them. In Proverbs 4.18, it talks there about the path of the righteous growing brighter. But the path of the just, that's the righteous, is as the shining light that shines more and more unto the perfect day, unto the full day, unto the full, uh, what it's talking about there is the full, fullness of the sun at noonday. The path of the just, the path of the righteous grows brighter and brighter. And as we understand our righteousness, we can depend on that, that our path will go right, brighter and brighter. Healing in the gift of righteousness. Romans 8, uh, verses 10 and 11. We use, we're very familiar with 11, but let's look at 10. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life 
because of righteousness. Because we are the righteousness of God, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall quicken, shall give life to your mortal bodies. Because we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And because Jesus lives in us, that same Spirit that raised Him from the dead will quicken, give life to our mortal bodies. So there is healing in our righteousness. So it is important for us to understand, like I've said, who we are in Christ. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So I would encourage you to meditate on these scriptures that I've given you and read the context around them. Because as we begin, as we continue into these last days, understanding who we are in Christ, as the perilous times become more and more perilous, as more and more uh, things happen to, in, this, uh, in this world, in this nation, uh, economically, and in the medical field, and all these different things, as persecutions arise, knowing who we are in Christ, that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, is going to be a foundational understanding. Because, because we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, God is not withholding anything from us. And we can stand before any person, any situation, and know that because we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, these things have to go. And we will be overcomers. You know, the scripture promises that we will be overcomers. Now it gives us a choice. A choice that we can choose to be overcomers or not overcomers. But if we choose to be overcomers, we will be overcomers. And the benefits of being an overcomer are beyond what we can imagine. We, as ark builders, need to understand that. We need to be overcomers. And understanding who we are in our righteousness in Christ Jesus is a foundation to us being an overcomer. Amen. Thank you, Jesus.